Hey Jeff, we're back today. We've been discussing the New Apostolic Reformation and um, theological beliefs like Proterism and Hello. Dominion Theology. And uh, so we'll, today we want to address some interesting issues related to people's perception of the New Apostolic Reformation. And uh, one in particular is that some people outside of the movement looking in um, consider enough deviation from basic Christianity or evangelical Christianity to consider um, that the New Apostolic Reformation is cult-like. Right. Now, we personally don't hold that opinion, but we can see um, some issues surrounding it. And so once again today, we've got uh, responsibility with Jeff's grandson, so we're going to hold to both taking care of the child and sharing information. So, but anyway, we want to uh, feature three characteristics Jeff's going to read in a second from uh, the Charisma article where C. Peter Wagner had to address this criticism that the New Apostolic Reformation can be viewed as a cult-like organization or movement or cult-like personality, uh, that sort of thing. And so uh, I want to identify three things related to cult-like thinking, which is, first of all, I was in the shepherding movement and uh, back in the early 80s, which was the tail end of it. And uh, w uh, the movement was also accused of being cult-like. And so we had uh, an emphasis on apostles and prophets. Uh, back then it was the Fort Lauderdale Five, and they like Derek Prince, Don Basham, and people of that nature. And uh, so they were teaching, these apostles were teaching uh, something true in scripture, which is discipleship, but now it was twisted and taken to the extreme. So we had a situation where uh, discipleship now became control. And so this issue about organizations that are religious in nature or spiritual in nature, Christian in nature, but then become controlling right. is, is a characteristic we have to look at. Then the other thing is this, is um, in the shepherding movement, it was a uh, real top-down level of authority hierarchical. and hierarchical and uh, governmental. And so the whole issue about discipleship back then was submission and authority. Mm -hmm. And uh, so you know, we had to submit to our shepherd. And it was more than just the, you know, the way that the, the Bible demonstrates uh, submission to authority. It was actually control. Right. They were taking control of your life and making decisions for you in the sense of we had a, a no dating policy in place. We also had a marriage issue in place that uh, they would have to approve of whether you can date a person or that you were thinking about uh, you know, a relationship towards marriage that your your shepherd had to approve of this. Mm -hmm. So there was a lot of manipulation, a lot of control. Uh, and uh, the other thing that's real interesting is if you would disagree with an organization that is controlling and manipulative, there's this ostracizing uh, capacity right. uh, where they, they shun you, they shame you and uh, they reject you. So it has a real strong circle drawn around it. Right? And uh, so when we see these schisms or, um, you know, uh, fracturing uh, around a personality, mm -hmm. uh, you know, that, that's what people accuse that it's a, a cult personality. It's driven by uh, an individual that controls a lot of people. Right. And so that's one of the uh, features. So first of all, we have control and then we have of this uh, devotion to an individual, uh, to even the point of what we're looking, the facts about the individual. Uh, one real strong, historical, obvious Christian-like cult is Mormonism. And the founder, Joseph Smith, who was an outright thief and a murderer, right, and uh, was shot in a gun battle, you know? Sorry. And uh, just the, the denial of the person's character flaws and also the lack of uh, credibility in relation to scriptures. The, uh, a man like Joseph Smith was an occultist too and used a seer stone. Right. Cool. And so we have the formation of uh, you know the Latter-day Saints and Mormonism based upon a man that was uh, a liar and a deceiver and a, a you know plagiarized uh, science fiction novel and 
integrated it with the new uh, or the King James Bible. And so uh, here, here's millions of people following this sham and fraud uh, in a Christian life cult. And then, uh, you know, finally is the insulating factor inside of movements where they're protecting their leader. Uh, it's like a, a no correction rule. Right. You can't touch this person. And so these are some of the characteristics. Now, um, there was enough issue going on inside of the New Apostolic Reformation um, that Charisma actually had to allow C. Peter Wagner, which is the uh, architect, the theological architect of the New Apostolic Reformation actually addressed the issue uh, in a public manner because so much criticism was coming about deviations with uh, apostles and prophets leading the movement and how they're deviating from the Word of God and how the practice was becoming stranger and stranger. So Jeff, could you uh, read from the Charisma article? Uh, well, C. Peter Wagner uh, writes in the article and says, the NAR is definitely not a cult. Those who affiliate with it believe the Apostles' Creed and all the standard classic statements of Christian doctrine. It will surprise some to know that the NAR embraces the largest non-Catholic segment of world Christianity. It is also the fastest growing segment. And then he goes on after that. So, so here's, here's something interesting. If you are outside of the New Apostolic Reformation looking in, and you see these uh, aberrations going on and a lot of them are simply theological and uh, how people then confronting the movement see a lack of correctability mm -hmm. uh, you know they they see these untouchables um, these figurehead apostles um, and then wonder why there's no accountability to the authority of scripture and this is real characteristic. Now, you saw something similar to this, Jeff, in your um, spiritual upbringing, as it were. You saw a cult think like movement that was very Pentecostal-like. Uh, can you share that a little bit? I actually uh, I came out of Mormonism. I was born uh, from above out of Mormonism and then ended up attending a church uh, with a very strong hierarchical uh, uh, situation, a pastor that was very controlling and liked things his way, and uh, a level of spirituality and different things that came in that were very unusual, and it was a very interesting and uh, informative period in my life, and very destructive in many ways. But what, when I look back on that period, what most amazes me is how all the thinking was the same. People actually looked very similar. They dressed the same way, they thought the same way, and there was a pedestal of, of pastors or elders in the church where uh, almost an awe, and I remember the pastor would walk through the lobby of the church and he would not talk to anyone or anything, he would go directly, and then he had his special intercessors that around him, etc. But there was a separation between the leadership and the people, and there was a thinking and a way of viewing the word and viewing what came forth from the leaders and from the pastor that put their words and what they said on a different level, uh, that was very unusual. And what, what we see in uh, these movements uh, that ha also have people concerned, like you experience, is this elevation of a man mm -hmm. uh, into proportions that the scripture never even allows for. Mm -hmm. In fact, a, a real apostle, a genuine prophet apostle, would never allow for the glorification of man to come into their ministry so they could have a platform, so they can market their ministry. Uh, we watched the Apostle Paul address the church at Corinth where uh, people were, were fracturing off and saying, well, I'm, I'm with Paul, and uh, you know he's my apostle. Mm -hmm. Then another would say, well, I'm with Peter. He's my apostle. And then another one, I'm with Apollos. Right. And then the real spiritual group said, well, I'm not with any of those. I'm with Jesus. And so all this fracturing was going on, and so Paul had to address the idolization. And he wouldn't dare let anybody, um, you know, boast in him and promote him. So what did he do? He re-centered people in Jesus Christ. This is what an authentic apostolic person would do, right. is they would insist in the centrality of Jesus Christ. And how did Paul do that? He brought him back to the cross. Right. <laughs> 
he, he reminded him that the glory in man was the, the vanity of deception and, you know, was from the fall of man right. and was more of a, uh, you know, a carnal uh, uh, operation inside of the church. So what did he do? He brought him back to the centrality of Jesus Christ mm -hmm. uh, and the cross. A true apostle will center people back into Jesus Christ in the central theme and message of Christianity. Well, I think that's what you'll see in groups that have a group think or a cult think or a, a different type of thinking than traditional Orthodox Christianity is, is uh, the opinions, the thoughts, or the exposition of Scripture by those that are leading the movement take over. And the actual basis, the basics of the Bible, the cross, uh, Jesus Christ, you know, the redemption, uh, resurrection, etc., kind of get pushed away, and the focus becomes a message, not the message. So, in the New Apostolic Reformation, we're seeing this in a major way. We're seeing people follow the special light right. given to an apostle, that they have special understanding of Scripture that, in relation to church history, nobody else had this understanding. Uh, just for an example, the fact that the Lord's Prayer has been interpreted historically through the church in a very classic, simple way of uh, dependence on Jesus, daily dependence on Jesus. It was never viewed as a uh, declaration of announcing that the kingdom of heaven is on earth and uh, that uh, we live from heaven to earth the way it's being taught today through, say, Bill Johnson and, and Bethel Church. And so now this is a special revelation given to Bill, an advanced understanding, and really it's nothing more than just dominion theology and a belief that the kingdom of heaven is the church now, now present on earth instead of a future coming kingdom at the return of Jesus. And, and many times there's a, an experience, a subjective experience that kickstarts the message or a, a visitation by an angel or or whatever it may be, and that kickstarts the message. Now, with uh, Bill Johnson, he talks about an experience that uh, from that time forward, he knew that he would never back away from the power uh, of the charismatic experience, and uh, this thing was about electricity just surging through his body, and, and a great display of, you know, almost incapacitating him, and he acquainted that with the work of the Holy Spirit. And like you're saying, so many of these influences that come to move a person away from the orthodoxy of Scripture to an experiential side in the denial of Scripture comes from supernatural encounters and experiences. In fact, the formation of cults like Mormonism or Jehovah's Witness, or we can even look into Islam and uh, what happened with Muhammad, is oftentimes this encounter of an angel or, uh, you know, the angel appearing and saying, you have the true revelation. Everybody else has a false understanding, but you're the special messenger. You have greater enlightenment, and you're going to bring this truth to the rest of the world. Isn't it interesting, going, kind of going back to the charismatic uh, wing of it, isn't it interesting that these experiences or these visitation by angels never results in a renewed power in the Word of God, a renewed interest in, in uh, exposing and developing redemption and re the resurrection and all these different things, it always points to something new. And that opens the doorway, right? In fact, one of the concerns, and we'll address this in the next session, is why does the New Apostolic Reformation point so much to futuristic events and new understanding and revelation on old interpretation of Scripture to such a level now that they're formulating their own Bible, that the New Apostolic Reformation is now adhering to the principles of the doctrine of dominion theology. We have to have our own Bible to give proper application to old interpretations of Scripture. This is no longer enough. So the, the elitism and the pride that comes into different movements where the old rugged cross or the Word of God is no longer sufficient and you need to, be go, to go beyond the boundaries that are set and the foundation that we have results in the need to <coughs> dismantle and deconstruct and reconstruct uh, the very thing that is the foundation of who we are. So.
So we, we see these issues of controlling people, special revelation, uh, elevated uh, personalities, personality cult-like followings, even in the presentation of facts, of issues, of deception, or uh, lack of credibility with the authority of scriptures. This is all going on in the New Apostolic Reformation, so we can see why there's a cult-like, um, you know, conf confrontation. Right. Now, one of the last things I want to touch about this cult-like thing is the inability to correct the leaders. Right. That the leaders are held into such a high regard or position that um, they're incorrectable, and this has become quite bothersome, that the polarization that's going on inside of the movement of, hey, uh, Bill Johnson is an accountable person. Hey, Chris Bellaton is an accountable person. The things that they say are held into an account by the authority of Scripture, and uh, they have to give an account. Instead, we see systems being built now uh, that surround the person with, like, watchdogs or, uh, you know, protection, preservation, and that, that has become uh, one of the things that you know, is, is in place now. One of the things that I saw when I was doing the, the writing on uh, Bethel Church was the concept or idea that we created a culture of honor. And so those that were inside of the system would honor the leaders, and they were all thinking the same. They are all doing dominion theology, but what about the people outside of the system who were not thinking the same, who were not a, affirming dominion theology? Then are they dishonoring? And that kind of thinking of those who are in and those who are out and the untouchableness of its leaders. So we have to see an issue related to um, these kinds of cult-like uh, methodologies that are in place that cause alarm, especially out with people outside of the movement. Now, I personally don't see the New Apostolic Reformation as a cult, but I do see all the tendencies that we've just talked about. And so, you know, we have to be very careful because it's easy for people uh, to be led in mass in some form of deception. And if you just don't believe that, just look at Mormonism, look at Jehovah's Witness. And I'll throw another one out that's kind of not very popular. Look at the Catholic Church, who's departed from the doctrines of the faith and has been in, uh, you know, in place for thousands of years or hundreds of years. And so it's not that hard to deceive people with spiritual principle and, uh, you know, religious organization. Well, uh, real quick, I just want to add this. Uh, probably the most damaging thing I see in the group think, cult thinking, uh, the following of a leader or a movement, is that we lose our personal responsibility before Jesus Christ. And that's the scariest thing of, of uh, movements that... Uh, stress things that are not strictly in the Word of God, that are not basics to Christianity, and began stressing another message. Uh, the, the person, the individual, gets lost in the message. They get lost in the movement. And they get lost before individual responsibility. And that's where why we use the terms cult think or group think. We're not labeling things cult, etc. We're saying there's a thinking, there's a process that people get under and it starts to pull them away from their individual responsibility and they think with the group or they think with that whole thing type of uh, attitude or, or reasoning. So this, that was a great summary, Jeff. Thank you so much. Uh, that's our concern. We're not looking necessarily and seeing the New Apostolic Reformation as a cult, but we do see characteristics and I think other people have pointed it out too. So hopefully this will be beneficial for people who are looking at the New Apostolic Reformation and its lack of correctability. And I think these things need to come to the table and uh, be addressed more openly. Um, that we need to have the character and the, and the um, uh, charismatic movement to openly talk about these things and address these issues. So hopefully this is a, a valuable tool and we ask the Lord to bless this and to touch many people with it in Jesus' name. Amen.